Hi there. Welcome to your next Rust lesson for CS128 Honors. I believe this is lesson number four, uh, and today we'll be discussing Rust modules and packages. I'll go ahead and just get started. So today's goals are to discuss Rust modules, to discuss importing code from other Rust files. We'll briefly give an example of installing and using Rust packages online. And we'll also talk about MP0 and Homework0, which at this point should be released and on Prairie Learn. Okay, so uh, just a quick recap with Matt's previous videos. Uh, you learned about variables, mutability, and shadowing. You learned about types and control flow, if else for while loops, as well as uh, basic Rust input output. Um, these four things should be more than enough to, to do your homework in MP0, but I will continue teaching you things um, during, of course, uh, that, that might help here and there. Um, additionally, and I'll mention this later as well, is we'll be getting, uh, we will start office hours, uh, probably starting this Friday. Um, we're not quite sure what hours will work best for everyone, so uh, we'll announce what hours we're planning on doing, and if you can't attend a certain time, please let us know, and we'll start to move them around to make sure everyone at least has uh, some opportunity to attend office hours if they feel like that's necessary. Okay. So uh, let's continue with the content of today's lesson. So let's talk about modules in Rust. So um, a quote from the Rust textbook is that modules let you control the organization, scope, and privacy of paths. Paths, of course, being the way that we're going to refer to these various things. These things being various modules, various functions, or structs inside of a module or a function, or just sitting outside somewhere. Okay. Um, and, and we'll see these paths, and in fact, you saw these paths very briefly in Matt's previous video. Um, basically, any time you're using those double colons, you're referring to something's path. Um, so let's give this quick example. So we have a module called front of house, and this, uh, this module is maybe outlining some of the behavior or outlines some of the functions for a restaurant. And so we have two parts, uh, two sub-modules, hosting and serving. And inside the hosting module, we have things like add people to a wait list, uh, seating people at a table, and serving has stuff like taking orders, serving orders, and taking payments. Of course, we're not actually going to build out these functions, so we have no parameters and the, the code for them is empty. But you could very well have the same kind of organization uh, fully fleshed out with actual code that does things. And the way I want you all to visualize these is like this. So at the very root, we have the crate uh, keyword, we'll say. And then inside of this is kind of this hierarchy of modules. And if any of you have seen this type of chart before, uh, maybe this looks very similar to how files and folders are laid out. And I think that that's a really good analogy to make. And in fact, we'll see how this ties in closely with files and folders in just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, keeping in mind that, you know, this is just a way to organize these different modules, these different functions together in a way that, that sort of resembles this hierarchy that we want or any hierarchy that we want. Okay, so there's three major ways to create modules. First, as we saw, is the mod keyword. And so if in our function we have, or if in our uh, main.rs file, we would like a, a module that you know has this watch lecture function, we can say mod cs196 function watch lecture. And that's about it. Now equivalently, we can put this file, or put the code in a file with the module's name that we want. So in the cs196 file, we can have the watch lecture function. And then in the main.rs, we can say mod CS196, and it will import this code in. And then the third way is in a folder with the mod.rs file, with the code in the mod.rs file. And so the only change here is this path. Instead of CS196.rs, CS196 becomes a folder, and mod.rs becomes a file in that folder. Of course, we can have many other files in that folder that might you know, help with this. Um, but may basically, these three different ways to do it are uh, just kind of helpful in, in case your module gets kind of very, very large, right? If it's very small, you probably only need to do it uh, with the mod keyword in the same file if it's maybe, you know, um, intermediately large, then you might want to put it in a separate file, and maybe if it's very, very, very large and has many sub-modules and other things, uh, it, it probably would like to be in its own folder. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit about module privacy. So if we remember this quote, 
uh, modules let you control the organization, scope, and privacy of paths. Well, this scope and privacy are kind of very key to how we use modules. And so let's uh, take this quick example. We have mod CS196, lectures and homeworks, and inside homeworks we have get solution and evaluate solution. In our main function, we'll refer to the path of the get solution function, CS196, homeworks, get solution, and we'll attempt to call it. So does this compile? Well, I wouldn't really be asking if the answer was yes. Uh, it does not compile, and it has the error module homeworks is private. Uh, the module homeworks is defined here, and it gives us the location. Okay, well, um, obviously we need to make this public in some way, this homeworks module, and so we can add the pub keyword, pub, of course, for public. But when we run this, or at least when we try to build this cargo build, uh, we'll get the same error, or at least a similar error. Function get solution is private. And so hopefully the more keen of you can figure out how to fix this as well. Um, you know, if we were able to fix the homeworks being private with the pub keyword, we can do the same with the get solution. So we can say pub function get solution, uh, pub function homeworks, and uh, that, that will work for us. And so this compiles and, and this would execute any code within the get solution function, if there were any, which of course we can see there's none. Okay. Um, so that's just a quick note on uh, module privacy. So if any of you ever run into that, keep that in mind. And in fact, uh, having modules be private can sometimes be very useful uh, in, in case you don't want to kind of have a, a specific user be able to execute code um, that's maybe uh, more fine grained than you'd like, right? Okay, so let's talk about module scopes. Uh, if your module is very, very large, we can use the use keyword to make your life easier. And so, for example, if we have this uh, evaluate MP0 solution and we wanted to say CS196 assignments MPs MP0 evaluate MP0 solution, um, that's not only a mouthful, that's a lot of keystrokes and uh, programmers are very lazy. And so we can use the use keyword to uh, cut down on that. And so we can say use self CS196 assignments MPs MP0. And that will put everything in the MP0 module in our scope. And so then when we want to execute it, we can say MP0, uh, evaluate MP0 solution. Rather, a better way to have worded this would be it puts the MP0 module in our scope. Okay, um, let's talk very briefly about this difference between self and crate. So, of course, um, this file, this main.rs file, is kind of sitting at the very top. And this CS196 module is kind of the equivalent of front of house. So, in this purpose, we only need to use self. Uh, in order to kind of uh, start at the uh, CS196 location, right? Because we're already at the root of our file directory. But if all of these modules were separated into separate files, into separate folders, um, we would maybe need to use crate to do an absolute path into a specific function or location that we'd like. So just keep this in mind. Um, you know, this is kind of the number one way to visualize it is back to this file hierarchy. Um, you know, just keep this in mind. Self, of course, is going to refer to wherever you are, main.rs being, you know, at the very top. And then crate will refer to uh, the very top as well, and you can go down from there. Okay, so that'll be very useful, um, especially once you start to do your final projects. Um, we really will expect you to use these modules and to, you know, separate your code into different files and to have good core code organization uh, as you go through those. Um, you know, you all, you all are quite advanced programmers at this point, and you'll be even better by that point. And so, you know, having one massive Rust file that's, you know, maybe 2,000 lines in a single function, uh, well, hopefully it's not 2,000 lines, but, uh, you know, that, that's probably not best. Um, and definitely not going to be fun for me to read. And so uh, I'll be in a bad mood, and, you know, I'm the one that's grading it, so. Okay, so let's do a quick example, a quick uh, live demo of using external packages. So for this purpose, I'll put my uh, window up here and I'll make it a little bit larger for you all. Okay, and so um, let's uh, pull this up. Okay, so quick things you'll notice is I'm in my Vagrant kind of folder, um, just in SRC, and uh, we'll make a brand new package. Um, so we'll say, we'll call it, uh, I think I already have one called modules, and so we'll call it packages. And it'll take just a moment, and we'll move into this directory. Okay, and once again, we can see just the basic setup. Uh, and the big idea that I wanna teach you right now, and especially this is gonna be useful when you do your final projects, is using external packages. And of course, if you're working in things like Python, uh, some of you might be familiar with like pip install or conda install. 
Um, well, you know, in Rust, we have a uh, cargo install. And so we can go to the crates.io uh, website, which has all of Rust's crates, which is what we also call packages. I'll shrink this down just so you all can see. And uh, we'll pick a random one. Rand is the most downloaded one, and so we'll use this. There's two ways to install packages. The first way being cargo install rand. And so that's what we'll do. And the second way is to take this line here and to place that in cargo.toml. But we can see we'll run cargo install rand and we can see exactly what this will do. Uh, this will just take a moment. Oh, there's nothing to install because it has no binaries. Okay, so yeah, I guess Rand is one of these packages that uh, doesn't have kind of executable code. It's just kind of helper code. And so in this case, we will have to use the uh, normal install method. Okay, so in this case, we'll ls, we'll edit cargo.toml, and we can add this to dependencies. Copy this line, paste it, and exit. Great. Okay, of course we're not actually using it at this point, uh, so we will also need to use it. So we'll cd into source, we'll edit main.rs, and we'll read some of the RAND documentation to figure out how this is actually used. And so we'll say, look, uh, we'll just go to the API reference, and we can start seeing about how a little bit of it is used. Okay, so it says we can see here that they use RAND prelude uh, and they import everything, so placing everything we already learned about this RAND keyword, and then the, you can just call rand random directly from there. Okay, so we'll use rand prelude and we'll import everything. And we'll just have right here, we'll say if rand random, which we can see in the comment generates a random boolean. I'll make this large again. In this case, we'll uh, print another message that says, uh, hello, secret message great and we can cargo build and it'll first go through our cargo.toml file and it'll say hey you know we need to download this rand information of the rand uh, library i'll shrink it down as it runs and so we can now see that it's building We can see it's compiling all the necessary things for RAND, giving us an unused import warning, but that's fine. We still have RAND in our scope. Maybe we don't necessarily need all of the things imported. And we can also do cargo run. So this will just quickly rebuild. Of course, we've already uh, done it once, so maybe it'll be a little bit faster. And we can see this time we got hello world. If we run it again, if we run it again, you know, we have a random of 50% chance of getting the secret message. It seems like my luck is, uh, oh, there we go. Now it's like four and four and eight. All right. So yeah, about a 50% chance. Um, if any of you stats majors want to, you know, get the T-score there, um, feel free the confidence interval, but I believe it. So, you know, one thing that I just want to mention is when you're doing your final projects, uh, using external code is going to be uh, definitely allowed. Um, so, you know, we want you to do something as, as great as it can be. Obviously, just don't copy and paste code uh, from online. You know, you need to work with external code in your own project. But uh, there's many, 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 many super awesome tools here uh, for you to use. Google has their own thing, HTTP, in case you want to interact with the web. So tons of opportunities here to work with all sorts of cool stuff. Um, there's even board games, um, stuff like that. And so we'll encourage you to use some of these Rust packages to uh, make a cool project that does, you know, really whatever you'd like it to do. Okay. Okay. Continue. Um, finally, let's start discussing a little bit about uh, homework zero and MP zero. Uh, so these, at this point, uh, at the time you're seeing this, should be up on Prairie Learn and uh, able for you to do them. Um, just a quick run through. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how to add Prairie Learn in case not all of you are in it. But um, the due dates for these are 9.15 for Homework 0 and 9.20 for MP0. Um, we'll be, again, I mentioned we'll be hosting office hours to help with this, so I encourage you to attend. Um, if by chance, you know, we, we don't quite know what office hours times work best for everyone at this point, so we encourage you to reach out early if none of the times that we do decide on uh, work for you, and, and we'll make sure to accommodate. Okay, so first let's run through just adding uh, the course. After logging into Prairie Learn, go to add or remove courses, 
and you'll see right here CS128 honors and you'll add the course and of course you'll now see it here nothing too complex of course I can't see anything because these aren't released yet and this is the student account but um, I can give you a preview of them uh, at this point uh, here so first we'll look at homework zero um, this shouldn't be too difficult um, there's kind of just uh, there's four kind of short functions that you'll write um, you know just a quick example of one is returning a, a specific value uh, with a specific precision or a specific uh, uh, type we'll say um, same thing for this one in this one you'll return an emoji uh, so I encourage you you know you can use emojis as variable names and you know that's kind of fun and quirky so go for it I guess um, and so these are just some quick tests um, in both homework zero and MP zero I highly recommend uh, copying this code into your own machine and utilizing things like cargo tests on your own machine that's gonna make your life very easy and in fact in this case we've already written all of the tests for you um, and also maybe uh, for the future you can write your own tests which um, you know I, I think a lot of CS majors will hear their professors say write your own tests um, and you don't have to but uh, it is quite useful so I really do encourage you in a lot of cases to write your own tests especially 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 uh, when it comes to the MPs um, obviously with the homeworks uh, especially this homework um, we've written all the tests for you you don't need to add any ours are comprehensive I promise but when you write your own for the MPs um, it's not necessarily detecting if you're hitting edge cases or not as much as it is uh, finding out what your error is stemming from right what inputs does it work from what inputs does it not work from and that can very quickly lead you to uh, maybe some flaws in your code so speaking of the MPs let's look at MP0 okay so in MP0 we're gonna create a very basic five function calculator um, it's only gonna do a single operation and it's gonna take two uh, positive numbers or uh, uh, floats decimals whatever you want to call them and so a quick example is it could take the input um, I can't quite read what that character is I'm assuming it's a star um, two times five or 3.6 modulo 1.4 um, stuff like that the five operations of course are adding subtracting dividing multiplying and uh, modulo because we're uh, CS majors here and we use that a lot okay um, and we've provided you with a lot of code that can help kind of speed up the process most importantly is this enum the operation and enum um, and we'll learn more about that but it'll just help you a little bit okay you're gonna be completing three major functions and uh, I'll take this time to kind of discuss uh, ways you should be approaching these um, that might be able to help and at the same time I've noticed that there's a black bar at the bottom of my screen so I'm gonna work on uh, making this slightly larger maybe that'll help not quite sure why that uh, occurred but we'll see okay so first is the from char function um, this is pretty basic given some character being the operation you want to convert the character into one of these uh, five operations um, we've given you some documentation about this option type uh, we encourage you to read those um, and also uh, we'll very briefly kind of look at uh, how to use this enum in a bit so that's very basic given the character return the operation next is the parse equation function this given some string you're going to return uh, a tuple and this tuple has three items in it uh, the first number in the expression the second number in the expression and the uh, the element or the sorry the operation for the expression um, once again you know we've provided you with some documentation uh, a huge part uh, that we want to kind of emphasize in this class is that reading documentation uh, helps a lot and so um, you know we encourage you we've linked lots of documentation we encourage you to read them uh, it's very straightforward um, and so just a quick example for you know 5 times 6.3 we return 5 6.3 and uh, multiply of course you know the order of these two does matter um, maybe not necessarily for multiplying but for many of the others uh, it will okay and then we've also given you a quick hint um, the split function will probably make your life very easy uh, and the trim as well and then finally the solve function and one more thing to mention is I encourage you know you all to write this such that the solve function is using this and this is using this um, that will make your life even more easy um, okay finally the solve function so this solve function uh, will call the parse equation function which in turn will probably call the from character function uh, and this will you know given some string return some output um, some value 
And so, you know, the big thing that I want you all to envision here is, uh, you know, depending on what operation you want to do, uh, you know, control the flow of your program uh, to, to, you know, perform these, this operation on these two numbers. Okay, um, so some quick notes. Um, you know, this is all kind of new and by hand. Uh, so some quick notes is we have built our own custom auto grader for this. Um, it can be slow. Sometimes it can be buggy. Uh, we will do our absolute best to fix them. And historically, uh, we're pretty fast with fixing them. You know, usually within a couple hours of seeing a bug, uh, it will be fixed, if not much, much shorter. Um, but, you know, uh, I encourage you nonetheless to run this on your local machine um, and, and possibly write out some tests there because it will really truly make your life a lot easier. The auto grader is slow and your own machine is probably significantly faster. We've provided you with a zip file that has all of the necessary things for you to run. Um, and once again, you can use homework zero as a reference to write your own test cases. Okay, and this is the code that we've provided you for, with. Um, yeah, so just some quick examples. Uh, if, for example, you know, we need to access something within, is it, is my character? Where's my cursor? Oh, this is a saved web page. I can't type on this. Let me uh, pull this back up. Okay, so if, for example, we'd like to uh, work with the operation uh, enum, we can always refer to one of these like this. Operation colon colon add uh, is a way that uh, we can access the add kind of element of the operation enum. Um, and really, uh, if any of you are familiar with enums, this is just a way of kind of listing different items that uh, help organize them a little bit easier. I don't really quite have a way to uh, explain that otherwise. Okay, um, and then finally, let's talk about a little bit of syntax that we haven't mentioned yet, um, just in case any of you want to get started earlier. So we have public functions here uh, within this operation class or um, um, struct. Um, this is, says it's going to take uh, a symbol as an input, and that symbol is going to be of type, whoops, of type char or char character, and it's going to return an option for an operation. Uh, option, again, documentation here. Next, of course, uh, input type for the input, uh, and then it's going to re return a result uh, of this tuple flow32, flow32 operation. And then finally, this one, you know, input is a string, output is flow32. Okay, um, well, I hope that uh, helped you all. Um, again, we'll announce office hours uh, very soon. Um, I encourage you to get started on these early, uh, just in case you do need help. Um, we're here to help. Uh, give us feedback on the homeworks and the MPs. And uh, I hope you enjoy and I hope you learn a lot about Rust still. So thank you and bye-bye. Uh,